ADHD, y'all will be attending my funeral because my wife has said she's going to kill me. I'm still in school. Can you believe that? My daddy asked me one time when I got through with my master's and I went back for my first doctorate, he wanted to know, are you ever going to get educated? So um, I don't think I am. Take your copy of God's Word. Look with me this morning at chapter 2 uh, of uh, 1 Peter. And uh, just like last week, I've got to come and begin to kind of unpack um, what's being said here because verse 18 if you have the New American Standard, if you have the King James, if you have the ESV, it uses the word servants. If you have the Christ, uh, Christian Holman or the Christian Standard, I should say is what they call it now, it uses, uh, it uses the word slaves there. Uh, the others use the word servants. Um, I think the Christian Holman really captures it best when it uses the word household slaves. Now, what in the world do you do, <laughs> oh, Lord, in a day, this is as bad as dealing with the government, in the, in the atmosphere and the time we live with this whole issue of slavery? And, and as I begin into this passage, I have to stop and deal with it because the only context that we have in America and especially in the South is that of colonial uh, slavery, the slavery during the early part of our American history. Uh, what you need to understand is that Rome was different in its concept of slavery than we were in America. So you're going to have to take your Western mind out for just a moment and think a little differently. Uh, our slavery in this country was all based on race. It was racial slavery. Uh, Rome could care less about race. If they conquered you, you were their slave. Uh, so there's a huge difference between the two, and you have to understand that difference. They didn't care what your color was. They didn't care what your culture was. When Rome marched in, you became their slaves. Now, this word is a little different here than the word doulos. The, the word doulos in the New Testament in Greek is the word slave. And there are different shades of that. This word is orkates. It comes from the word oikos, which is home. Oikates was a house servant, a house slave. Now, there is a difference in that, in, in this. A house slave was a professional. Now, this is where slavery in the Roman Empire and the Greco-Roman world uh, is different than what our history is uh, a house slave in the Greco-Roman world was somebody who was educated. In fact, they probably educated the family that owned them. Uh, they were professionals in that they could have been doctors. Many of them were. Uh, many of them were teachers, writers, poets, artists. Uh, they had some professional trade of some kind. In fact, they were paid. They were owned, but they were paid to do what they did. They earned somewhat of a salary, albeit small. They could save their money and purchase themselves out of slavery. They could also um, buy other slaves. It was not uncommon for an orchitess to have a doulos. That is, for someone who was a house servant to own uh, a slave uh, that happened to be theirs. So you can see that there's a vast difference here. And when you come to deal with this, you're go it's going to make more sense if you've got a little bit of that background. Now, here is the thing about Christianity and this whole issue of slavery, that there are those who through the years, not just in our day, uh, but down through the years, there are those that have said scripture supports slavery. That has even been preached from pulpits, that uh, Scripture supports the whole concept of enslaving a race of people. Uh, there are those that say it never speaks out against slavery, that it never um, um, deters slavery, uh, that it never calls for a revolt on slavery. Now, I want to do something very quickly, and this is why I hope you've got a copy of God's Word. You've got a pencil. You've got something you can write with, something you can write on, because I want to give you the truth of Scripture in the issue of slavery. 
Exodus 21 verse 16 says this, he who kidnaps a man, whether, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. Now, does that kind of end everything right there? If you catch somebody and you make them your slave, we'll just kill you. Now, that seems to settle the whole issue of slavery in the Bible to me. Amen. Yes, sir. Kind of takes care of it, doesn't it? We'll just, we'll just kill you. Let me go on to Deuteronomy chapter 24. When I saw these uh, high school students here, you know, that's, uh, that's what Moses started over with. All their parents had died, and he started over with all these 19-year-olds, 19 and 20-year-olds. So he gives them the law again, Deut Deuteronomy, Deuteronomos, second law. He comes and to that generation, he says, if a man is caught kidnapping any of his kinsmen, countrymen of the sons of Israel, and he deals with him violently or sells him, then that thief shall die. Again, he comes and he says, if you take somebody as a slave, you go and you capture or you purchase or whatever you do, and you're going to use that per person as a slave, we'll just put you to death. Leviticus 19.34, the stranger who resides with you shall be to you as a native among you. Now, did you hear that? Anybody that moves into your country, they shall be a native among you. You shall love him as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. In other words, don't argue about it. That's the way it is. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. I won't go through that whole passage there. Paul is talking about a number of things, but if you'll look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, you see the word kidnapper? That is somebody who deals in trading slaves, somebody who captures slaves, somebody who deals in the slave industry there. He speaks against it right there. So the debate is this. Well, why doesn't the New Testament call for a rebellion? Why didn't Paul, why didn't Peter, why didn't Jesus say, we would like for y'all to all be little John Browns and go and find the nearest armory at a Harper's Ferry and just create a revolt where you go out and slaughter all the slave owners? Now, does that sound like something Scripture would tell you? <laughs> it doesn't deal with that. That's not what it's dealing with. It doesn't tell you to, it's your job, and that's where we're going, that if your job, you're in a job that's a little unfair, you're in a job that's very difficult, you're in a job that's hard, you become normal rate. Do, do I probably need to, do a couple of y'all that are over 50 know the movie Norma Ray. You know, you just rise up and you revolt against the corporation, the, the company. Kind of the, Scripture doesn't tell you that either. Listen to what Scripture is doing. Scripture comes to where you are. And what it does is it explains to you how you live the Christian life in the situation and the circumstance you find yourself. It doesn't come in issue words about revolt and rebellion. That's why last week we saw you submit yourself to the government even when your leader happens to be a demonically possessed person like Nero. It doesn't come and tell you to riot and to rebel and to burn. and to it, it comes to talk to you about the situation. This is the situation I'm in. What do I do in the situation that I'm, that I'm in as a follower of Jesus Christ? Now, that's where, that's where Scripture is. This is what Peter is doing. Most of the church was made up of slaves. Probably most of the people that Peter had heard from out of Asia Minor were most likely slaves. And being slaves in a household somewhere, they were, they were required to worship the God of their master. Even if you were not a slave and you worked for somebody, it was generally understood you would worship the God of your master. Now you've got these people who are slaves, who are employees, and they're working for, for someone and they are saved, they know Christ, and they're not going to worship these pagan gods. And so their employer looks at them and makes life tough on them because they think they're being rebellious. They think they're being um, hard-headed. They think they're being somewhat antagonistic toward them. 
So Peter is going to write, and he's, not, he's going to tell, this is what you do in the situation that you're in. And we're going to have to look at this in the, in the employer-employee relationship, which is really what it discusses here, and come to understand this, that as Christians, we are to demonstrate a Christian witness in our work. Where we work, in our work, we display this Christian witness. Now, let me just begin to walk you through this passage, beginning in verse 18. Uh, you come to this, and what you're going to see, first of all, is this personal word of instruction, verse 18. He comes and he says this, servants, be submissive. Now, that's the major verb right there. It dominates everything that is going to be said in the rest of these verses all the way down through verse 25. Be submissive. It points back, remember, to what was just said last week. Last week, verse 13, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every, every human institution, to the government, to those that are in authority. Well, it all goes back to verse 12 of chapter 2 where it says this, you keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Where am I supposed to keep my behavior like Christ in this world? He says, well, here are a couple of ideas. One is toward the authorities. Whatever authorities are over your life, you be submissive to them and you hold your behavior excellent. You live out the life of Christ when it comes to the place where you work. When it comes to the place where you work, you hold your behavior as excellent. You live out the life of Christ. Now, I realize you say, well, wait a minute, that lets me out. I'm retired. A lot of you here are retired, but you volunteer in places. You find yourself in things, volunteering, working in places. It still carries the same idea. We had all of these graduates up here. They've not gotten a full-time job yet. Many of them work part-time jobs. It includes that. Many of them are in the classroom. It includes that. In the classroom where I study, I'm to have this same mindset. And certainly for all of us that work, all of us that are out there in the work world, he comes and he says this, you employees, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Now that's easy when the guy is great, when he's good to work for. Not only to those that are good and gentle, however, but also to those who are unreasonable. Do you see the word unreasonable? Scoliois is the word there. What word comes to English from that? Scoliosis, crooked. Now, I take the word there to mean not crooked in his business behavior, but crooked in the way he treats people who work for him. Uh, he treats them in an unreasonable way. I think the NAS translates it pretty well there. Uh, he treats you in a harsh way, in an unreasonable way in a disrespectful way. You ever work, let me just ask a question. Don't anybody raise their hand, but just, you know, don't, don't give out too much information. Um, you ever work for somebody you just couldn't stand? You ever, you ever work for somebody that was just completely unreasonable? You ever work for anybody that was just hard and harsh and grumpy and always irritable and unpleasant? Sure you have. Sure you have. <laughs> Well, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's saying. Now, let me illustrate this from out of classical literature. All of you have, if you've not read Dickens' Christmas Carol, you have at least seen some version of it on television around Christmas. Do you remember in Dickens' Christmas Carol, Bob Cratchit, bless his heart, with his little family and little sickly tiny Tim whom they could not afford to have surgery. They gather around on Christmas Eve and they've got a most meager Christmas meal and they all sit down and Bob Cratchit lifts a glass to give everybody a toast. He toasts everybody and then he comes and he says, and Mr. Scrooge. And you remember his wife, you know, oh, no, and all the kids. And then Tiny Tim comes up, oh, no, not Mr. Scrooge. By the way, Tiny Tim went on to become the voice of Mickey Mouse. Um, oh, no, not Mr. Scrooge, not Mr. Scrooge, not him. And you remember what Cricket, uh, cr cricket cr Bob Cratchit says? He says, yes, even Mr. Scrooge. 
It's kind of an interesting play there on somebody. You remember what Dickens said? Uh, he, he, the, the, the coldness of his heart froze the features of his face. You know, you remember that expressive language? That was him. He was cold at heart. He was cold on the inside. And uh, he was unkind and he was difficult. And yet the word of God says, regardless of that, it says not only to those who are good and gentle, but to those who are harsh and difficult and hard to get along with. When you're in that situation, what you have to constantly remember is this. I cannot let the attitude and the disposition of this employer influence my life as a Christian because he doesn't control me. I am controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit controls me. If you're saved, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you need to understand, listen, he doesn't control how I respond. So it comes with this personal word of instruction first, but then it comes with this word about providential intention. Why would God let this happen? Why does God allow me to work for a boss that is so difficult to work for? I never can make him happy. I'm unfulfilled. He seems to be unfulfilled, or she seems to be. It can be a man or a woman. It doesn't make any difference. They seem to be unfulfilled, whoever they are. They're never happy. They're, they're never, you're, you can never satisfy them. No matter what you do, it never satisfies them. Even when you do it the way they want it done, they still are dissatisfied. Why does that happen? Now, I'm going to show you in verse 19, and you're not going to like it because I don't like it. But now here it is, verse 19. This finds favor. Do you see that? This finds favor. That word favor right there is the word charis in the Greek. It's the word grace. This finds grace. In other words, in the midst of this, this is when grace bubbles up out of you. And my, I can remember my, my paternal grandparents, my dad's mom and dad, um, when you would go to their sink, they had a pump there. And they always had a little bucket with a dipper in it. Uh, does anybody know why there was a bucket of water and a dipper at that pump? You had to prime it. You had to pour water down that pipe that pump so that when you began to pump, the water would come up. Now, listen, let me tell you something. I want you to understand this, that no matter what situation you're in, when somebody pours harshness or bitterness or upset or irritability down you, what should come up is grace. Grace. What should come up is different than what they're pouring down you. This gives you the opportunity to express and pour forth and ooze out grace. If for the sake of conscience, do you see that right there? If for the sake of conscience toward God. In other words, what he's saying, what that text says is this, understand that you are standing before God. You may be looking at your boss, but you need to know God is standing there. For the sake of conscience toward God. A person bears up. The word hupo pharaoh. Pharaoh means I carry along. Hupo means under. I'm under this, but I'm still carrying along this weight. In other words, I'm still doing the work I'm supposed to do. I'm still carrying this load, and I am doing it in the midst of all of this harshness, in the midst of this disrespect, in the midst of this hurt, in the midst of this woundedness, under sorrows when suffering unjustly. It doesn't come to you fairly. This isn't legitimate. Now, sometimes it is legitimate, but here he's saying this is not legitimate in any way. You're, you're working for somebody who is pouring down you upset and anger and all these kind of things. You know, I read a statistic this, this week that said 80% of Americans experience anxiety at work. 80%. Now, listen to this. 42% of Americans say 
uh, that um, they have been yelled at, hollered at, screamed at at work. 42%, almost half. I'm not going to ask you, has that ever happened to you? 18%, nearly one out of every five say they have been threatened at work, intimidated with threats at work. 25% say that work is the greatest stress and anxiety in their lives. Now, listen to what he just says right here. He comes and he says, listen, if when they pour into you all of this upset, you just ooze back out, you pour back out grace for the sake of consciousness toward God. In other words, understanding God is ultimately who I answer to. God is here. God sees this. God knows this is unjust. God knows this is unfair. And uh, what I do in the meantime is I continue to do my job to the best of my ability. You say, when a preacher, I just don't like that. I know you don't. That's why nobody's amening in here. Because what you want the text to say is this, is if they treat you that way, you lambast them and strike back out at them. Now, who does that represent? Represent your flesh. It sure doesn't represent God. He comes to say, now listen, and I tell you why we think that way, in all honesty, because you watch too many television preachers. And you got it in your mind, well, oh, I'm a Christian now. I, I'm supposed to go into work, and there's never going to be anything. To, they're never going to find anything wrong with me. It's just going to be a raise after year after year after year, and they will applaud my work because nothing. God will never let anything difficult or harsh or hard or struggle ever occur in my life. Have you ever stopped to think that God allows that because that may be what's good for you? You may be in a difficult situation right now, a hard, a tough situation right now because God is trying to do something in your life and we don't like that. In fact, I want to tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to flip back to Romans real quick right here. Romans chapter 8. If you've got a Bible, you can look back there. I'm going to tell you what a tele-evangelist, and I'm not going to give his name, said about uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 35, where Paul writes and says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword or a bad boss or a bad job or a tough employer? or a harsh employer, will that separate you from the love of Christ? Absolutely not. Remember what Peter says, for the sake of the consciousness of God. Listen, God is there. But I'm going to tell you what we think. We think the way this tele-evangelist put it in his book. The love of Christ will separate us from tribulation and distress and persecution and famine, nakedness and harsh bosses and difficult times and struggles. That is heresy. I'm here to tell you God allows us to walk through difficult days because no better time in your life to pour forth grace and show the love of God than in a difficult situation like that. Now, you say, well, now, wait a minute, Pastor. What if I'm being intimidated? What if I'm being... And let me say this to women. If you're being intimidated, especially physically, if you're being sexually intimidated, you've got laws on your side and you should immediately use those laws. Now, I want you to hear that. That's why he's just talked about government here. We have it under our government. That's why God gave government. It was for our good. God intends government to be for the good of the people. And you have laws available to you and you say, Pastor, right now I'm in a terrible situation and uh, I can't quit my job, but I am being sexually harassed and I am being intimidated and threatened physically, you need to come see a pastor or an elder. We may not be able to solve the issue, but by golly, we'll pray and we'll walk alongside you with this. He comes and he says this, this finds favor that I do what? that I pour forth grace, that I understand that God is here, that I bear up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For when credit, for what credit is there, verse 20, 
when you sin and harshly are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. In other words, and, and let, me, let me just say this. I've got to tell you this as well on the other side. <laughs> um, through the years as pastors, I, I've had bosses come to me, employers come to me. I've had co-workers come to me. I've had people come to me and say, I'm so mistreated. You know, they're, they're not treating me fair. They're not doing me right. They're not this and that and the other at work, and I'll invariably have somebody come and say, I work alongside them, and the fact of the matter is they're always late, they're never on time, they've always got a gripe, they don't do their work. Many of us have to pick up their load. For whatever reason, some Christians think that being a Christian means I can be lazy at my job. I can do my work or I can do less work and everybody's got to just treat me sweet and nice and kind because I'm a Christian even though I do not do the job I should be doing. Well, there's a Greek word for that. <laughs> I want you to listen to something. A number of years ago when Larry Burkett was alive, um, in Atlanta, I was speaking in Atlanta and they called me and they said, uh, we know that you're in Atlanta. Would you come over and lead devotionals uh, for our whole uh, uh, company here? Uh, he was on the radio writing books and he had this whole thing about financial planning and all of that. Y'all know it better than I do. Well, I went there and I led a devotional for all of the people at Larry Burkett Ministries and uh, just kind of walking with him and talking with him and meeting him, I came across something, something that was kind of interesting. He talked about um, on the air about hiring Christians, how you should hire Christians, how Christians are great workers, how Christians are people uh, that will put more work in the hours and not just put in hours. And he said he got this letter. He got a letter from a business owner that wrote and said, I heard your radio program and decided to hire all Christians. I did, but I have never had a more complaining, griping group of people. They were always mumbling about something. I now replace them with refugees. The refugees are grateful for work. They'll do whatever I ask. They don't grumble. They don't complain. I think American Christians need to wake up. Now, what kind of testimony was that to that obviously unsaved, lost employer? Look, I know you don't like this, but that, what else do I do? It's the next passage here. And if... Um, I don't give you the truth of it. I've done you no good whatsoever. I want you to listen to what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Whatever your, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Listen to Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, verse 7. If you've got a Bible, just look there with me. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men. Who is your ultimate employer? It's the Lord. Look over to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 and listen to what he says there. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. Do you see that? Do it, literally the word means from the soul, from the inward part of you as for the Lord rather than for men. Now, I've often said, I don't work for you. I work for the Lord. But the fact of the matter is, everybody here is my boss. Everybody. From those teenagers that were just here all the way to the oldest member. I am here to serve you. It's a joy at this church. Let me just say that. You've made pastoring an absolute joy. It's not always been so in ministry. But I am to work as if all that I do, I am doing it to Jesus Christ. So he comes with that providential intention. But then here is this perfect illustration. Let me finish with this. 
Verse 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. He now is going to illustrate all of that. He's going to give you an illustration of this. And he comes beginning in verse 21 and he says, for you've been called for this purpose. I want you to understand that there is a difference between a call and a career. Now, before you became a Christian, you may have had a career, but once you come to Jesus Christ, you have a call on your life. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But that's what he says right here. For you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Now, what am I supposed to do? When it comes to the workplace and it comes to doing what is right, I'm to be innocent. Look at verse 22. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Here he is, Jesus Christ, standing before those who accuse him of wrong. And do you know what? Nothing foul comes out of his mouth. By the way, Peter was there that night. You go back and read carefully in John's gospel. He was standing off in the courtyard as they were, as they had Christ on trial before the Sanhedrin and the high priest. Uh, and all that were gathered there, he heard everything they were charging him with. He heard everything that they were accusing him of. He heard the false witnesses that they brought in, and he never heard Jesus utter one single thing that was out of place or ugly. He was innocent, and nothing foul was found in his mouth. Number two, secondly, he was in control. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. Now, while they were there reading him the riot act, threatening his life, intimidating him, uh, even physically assaulting him, what did he do? He remained in control of his faculties. I never ever read that that I don't think of Victor Frankl the Viennese Jew who was a student of Freud who was captured by the Nazis and thrown into the prison, into a Nazi concentration camp. When they did that, what they did, he was very popular, he was very famous, and they wanted to humiliate him in front of everybody. So they stripped his clothes off and they brought him into a courtroom completely naked full of people. And they stood him before a judge and as he stood there, completely to embarrass him, to humiliate him, to degrade him, he stood there, and this is what Viktor Frankl said. He said, you can take everything away from me except one thing, and that is my attitude toward you. That's pretty good. For a psychiatrist, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's what he says right here. You stay in control. And number three, you keep entrusting yourself to the Lord. Look in the middle of verse 23. But kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body and on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you are healed. He comes and he says, you just keep trusting the Lord with the situation. You keep trusting him with your life. You keep reminding yourself and putting into your mind, listen, Christ holds me and he holds this in his hands. And let me give you one last passage to look at. Go with me if you would, if you've got your Bibles, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I want you just to listen to this verse as Paul speaks. And what he says here, he says, we toil working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. You ought to mark these two verses. We toil, we work, we're employed, we're out there doing our job, working with our own hands, and when we're reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We've been willing to become the scum of the world, the drag of all things, even to now. Why? Because I want to be the right kind of witness in my work for Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you three quick things, and then maybe I'll close with an illustration. 
Here are the three things. I told you as he began in verse 21, there's a difference between a calling and a career. Now, I want to give you three things. I want you to listen to this. A calling is something that comes from God. A career may be a God you start to worship. Number two, a calling is something God chooses for me. A career is something I choose for myself. Number three, a career may end with retirement, but the calling of God goes into eternity. As Christians, you're called. You may be a lot of things. Um, you are not Greg the engineer. You are Greg the Christian engineer. See, you are rich. You're not rich, the medical sales person. You are rich, the Christian who happens to sell medical devices. See, do you see what I'm saying here? That's your call. 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 What dominates is the fact that God had dibs on you. He died for you. And you should claim your work for the glory of God. On October the 12th, nobody likes to tell the story of Columbus anymore. 1492, October the 12th, he landed just off what we know to be the Bahamas. And he got in a boat and they rode into a little island that he would name that day. But as he got out of that little boat, on the shore there of that island, he had two things. He had a cross that they planted in the ground and he had the flag of Spain and he planted that in the ground. And he came and he said this as he stepped on shore. He said, today I claim this territory of Spain for the glory of God. And he prayed and he recorded his pay prayer in his ship's log and listened to what he prayed. O Lord Almighty, by thy holy word, thou hast created the heaven and the earth and the sea. Blessed and glorified be thy name, and praised be thy majesty, which has designed to use us, thy her humble servants, that thy holy name may be proclaimed in this, the second part of the earth. That's quite a prayer. You have designed to use us so that your name will be proclaimed in the second part of the earth. That's what you need to do tomorrow morning, whether you go to a business, whether you go to a classroom, where you go somewhere to volunteer, what you need to do is you need to walk into that place and you need to pray that prayer and you need to plant something down there that says, God, in this place, I claim it for the glory of your name. Let's stand. You want to talk making a difference in where you work and how you work? Just read that passage and let the Holy Spirit take it and just begin to apply it to your heart. Your place of work, your place of being educated, that student's desk or that place where you volunteer, whether it be at a door or behind a desk or the place where you, you happen to earn a living, listen, that place you need to claim for the glory of God. You need tomorrow morning to go into that place and say, Lord Jesus, I work for you. I'm yours. And what this world does to me matters little. But what I do in the name of Jesus will live for eternity. Use me in this place. Use me to be a witness. Even when my mouth is shut, use me to be a witness for you. Boy, you can't do that if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
If you never put your faith and your trust in him, somebody sitting in here this morning, you're saying, man, this is the most wild thing I've ever heard of working for somebody like that. I'm going to tell you the way you work is you get out there, you get ahead, you, 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 you do whatever you have to do. You scratch, you claw, listen. That's because you don't know Jesus Christ. And yet the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart this morning. You know that's done you absolutely no good. And what you need to do this morning is give your life to Christ. I invite you to do that right now. I invite others, others of you to come and be a part of this fellowship, to come and join this church. Or some of you just to come and get on your knees before God at this altar. Father, in these moments... We give ourselves this invitation, having heard your word about real life and knowing, Father, that there's no way we can honor you apart from our lives being submitted to you. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak now and draw, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Now, I'm gonna be standing right here like at every service Somebody here this morning need to make a decision for Christ or to join this fellowship, I'm here. I invite you to come. You come in these few short minutes.